Okay, great. So um, uh, please interrupt and ask questions uh, as as we go. I'm going to um, I'm not going to rush through my slides. And if the hour runs out and and I'm not done, we'll just stop there. It's okay. Um, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions. Uh, my goal for today is to tell you a little bit about the research area that that I'm involved in, which is um, computational material science. And so basically, it's using um, computer resources and modeling and simulation to be able to better understand um, the properties of different types of materials. And actually, one of the things that I really like about doing computational work um, is that you learn a lot about like coding, programming, software, uh, high performance computing, parallel programming, but then also you get to apply that knowledge to a wide variety of materials. And so in my group, we work on um, 2D materials, we work on thermoelectric materials, we work on photovoltaic materials. And so I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, a little bit about that as we go here. Um, but I thought I'd start with this. Um, which I think is a, a really nice quote, and I'll kind of just uh, read it to you. It, it's uh, from a DOE workshop that was held almost 10 years ago now, at 10 years ago now, actually. Um, but it was a workshop on computational material science and chemistry for innovation. Um, and this quote from the report from that workshop says this. It says, one can describe the history of civilization as a series of breakthroughs in material science and chemistry. Beginning with the Stone Age, we have progressed through bronze, iron, nuclear, and silicon ages. Materials lend their name to ages because materials define technological capabilities. Advances in materials have shaped history and the balance of economic and military power, iron and steel, gunpowder, ammonia synthesis, antibiotics, uranium and plutonium, and silicon-based electronics. And so if you really like stop and think about it, so much of what has happened in history uh, is so closely tied um, and, and really linked to, to developments in, in materials and, and technologies that, that arose out of those. And so that's, you know, I'm actually really interested in thinking about that uh, more. And so if you go back through this timeline here, uh, and this is a very nonlinear timeline, you know, looking at about 5000 BC, 2500 BC, Stone Age and Bronze Age, Iron Age after that. And then there's a lot more here, right? So suddenly the timeline gets squished 1930 to 2010. Uh, so many different things, rapid developments have, have really been coming about and they're all developments in different types of materials. Um, one thing though that happens as we get more and more technologically advanced with materials is that also at the same time a lot of the societal challenges that we face they also become more and more complicated uh, and and so here are some just examples of different application areas where i think you um, really see a need for improvements in material performance and so here's one example uh, this is a silicon solar panel array um, and so a photo, this, these are silicon photovoltaics. They convert incoming sunlight to electricity. And it's really kind of amazing to think that um, it took over 100 years since the photovoltaic effect was first discovered to be able to produce a commercially viable product like this and then get it to the point of like wide scale deployment in the world. Uh, I have a solar array on my roof at home right now. Um, and, you know, to get to the point where people like me, just individuals who, who live in houses can purchase solar arrays and put them on their roof took over a hundred years of like improving the technology, improving the manufacturing process, figuring out exactly how to optimize the properties of silicon to get the performance where, where we want it to be. Uh, similarly, um, another area, this is kind of a, a a shout out to the idea of thermoelectric materials. So I don't know if anybody here works on or is familiar with thermoelectric materials, but a thermoelectric material is 
pretty much uh, what it sounds like, like thermo and electric. It's a material that takes a temperature gradient or a difference in temperature and converts that into an electric current. Uh, so if you have a material and you make one end of it hot and the other end of it cold, uh, it'll respond by charges will start flowing and you'll create an, an electric current. Uh, that's a really valuable thing to be able to do if you think about it in society. We are always rejecting waste heat into the atmosphere. Uh, you know, from, from our cars uh, that generate waste, waste heat to our uh, power plants, uh, if we could find a way to take that wasted heat and, and do something useful with it, you know, convert it into electricity, that could be really, really beneficial. Um, but we don't really do that on a wide scale yet, unlike solar cells, um, because the technology just hasn't quite advanced yet to the point where it's completely you know, commercially viable. Uh, and here's some other examples also, like a hydrogen powered, the fuel cell powered bus. Uh, a, uh, the idea of developing lightweight, lightweight, high strength or high temperature structural materials, for example, um, for use on airplanes or, or, or the engines uh, inside of these airplanes or um, thermal hybrid desalination turbine blades. You know, turbine blades are, if, if you want to run a turbine, the higher the temperature is, the more efficient your thermodynamic cycle is going to be. And so we need to develop materials that are very uh, temperature resistant. They can withstand high temperatures. So a lot of materials challenges that, that we face in the world. Um, and at the same time, in order to meet a lot of those needs, uh, being able to meet those needs really requires optimizing often more than one material property at once. So obtaining that desired performance or functionality means we have to optimize a material, many material parameters, uh, taking advantage of many different degrees of freedom. So chemical components, micro or nanostructures, uh, electronic structures. This is just one example. So um, our current modern high strength high temperature steels that we use as structural materials. I don't know if anybody has a guess how many elements of the periodic table are currently used in our state of the art high temperature steels. Does anybody know this? It's, it's actually, um, it's about 15 or 16 different elements that appear and you have to mix them in exactly the right ratio and, and process the material in exactly the right way to get the desired properties. Um, so 16 different elements from the periodic table in our high strength, high temperature steels. Um, and so for someone like me, who is a computational modeler, the kind of question I like to ask myself is, is there any way that I could use a computer to try to predict or optimize that composition over 16 different elements. Uh, how, how would you go about doing that? And actually the answer is like nowadays, we, we can't do this. We, we don't know, uh, not at least at that level of complexity, uh, using modeling and simulation, it's an active research area, you know, how to be able to really optimize the composition of a steel to get the best performance that you're looking for. Uh, it's another example of kind of material complexity. So integrated circuits, um, when they first started, just used a couple of elements from the periodic table. Nowadays, when you buy a computer, if you go in and look at the circuit board, um, you'll see all these elements from the periodic table are actually used in there somewhere. And, and somebody had to come up with each different component and optimize its performance to be able to give us uh, the modern electronics that we use nowadays. And then just another idea here in terms of where we see complexity in materials, uh, the idea of photocatalysis. So finding a material that is really good at taking incoming sunlight uh, and using the energy of that sunlight to be able to take water molecules and split them into hydrogen and oxygen to be uh, where, so that you can then use that hydrogen as a clean fuel um, that we could burn rather than burning fossil fuels or, or carbon containing compounds and releasing those into the atmosphere. 
And so, you know, water splitting, taking a water molecule and creating hydrogen and oxygen out of it is something that is a, a uphill chemical reaction. It takes energy. Uh, and finding a, a catalytic material that allows us to take that chemical reaction, take that chemical reaction uphill and do it efficiently is, is a really tricky thing to be able to do. Um, so in, in my research, kind of the, the, the big tool that we bring is modeling and simulation and, and kind of the use of big computers to being able to predict material properties. If you tell me what atoms or what components you're going to put into those, into those materials. So um, just there's a, a little bit of background here because I, I want to try to like share kind of the, the awesomeness and the cool complexity of this problem. Uh, and so in quantum mechanics, you know, really, if you want to be able to predict the properties of materials on a computer, we kind of have to solve on a computer the equation that governs the properties of materials. And, and that equation is the quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation. It's, it's kind of like uh, the F equals MA, the Newton second law of classical mechanics, but now applied to the world of atoms and nuclei and, and electrons. Uh, it's actually, you know, it's, it's a, an equation that um, is one that, let's say you have, you know, just one particle uh, embedded in a, a potential field. And so I'm not gonna kind of go through a whole, whole lot of, of math in this presentation, but I just did want to show you this equation and, and give you an idea of what this thing looks like. Um, there's really one key quantity that we try to solve for when we model materials uh, at the quantum mechanical scale on a computer. And the thing ideally that we'd like to be able to solve for is this thing psi, which is the wave function of the material. Uh, it's a function that we're trying to solve for and the equation that we're solving is, is a differential equation here. So this, this Schrodinger equation is um, a linear partial differential equation and it tells us how the wave function evolves in time. Uh, it tells us how that wave function evolves in time. And um, it's a, if I could solve for this wave function for a particle of like say atomic nuclei and electrons, in principle, not necessarily in practice, but in principle, I could tell you the, property, the, the properties that you care about for any material of interest. Uh, every aspect of a material, its elastic constants, the speed of sound in the material, the material's electronic structure, whether it's a good conductor of electricity or a bad conductor of ele electricity, all of those properties are kind of buried in this wave function. And so solving for this wave function is, is a really important thing to be able to do. Uh, now, imagine I have kind of just like one particle, let's say one electron, uh, and, and it's stuck in, in, in an electrostatic potential. Uh, in that case, the equation kind of looks the way I have it here. And the thing I want you to notice is that this function that I wanna solve for, this function psi, the wave function, is now a function of the position of that one particle, which is a three-dimensional vector, and time. And so that I can handle. Uh, R, you know, we live in a three-dimensional world, so this vector is, is a, is a three-dimensional vector, and then I have time, so I'm solving for a four-dimensional function. And this is something that we can do. Uh, this is the, what the Schrodinger equation looks like, for example, for the hydrogen atom. Uh, for the hydrogen atom, and then I'm solving for the steady state solution. So the time variable is gone. I'm solving for uh, the situation where, if you go back here just a second, where we set this time derivative to zero so that we solve for fixed values of the wave function. Um, then the Schrodinger equation for a very simple case, and this is really like the only time we can solve this exactly, uh, where I've got one particle, an electron, 
and it's embedded in the electrostatic field of the, the nucleus of the atom, the proton here. And the Schrodinger equation looks like this, and then my wave function is just a function of three-dimensional space. Uh, and, and when this happens, we know how to solve this equation. And, and if you take like a beginning quantum mechanics class, it'll probably be one of the examples that, that you go through in that quantum mechanics class is solving for the states of a hydrogen atom. Uh, and if I take the solutions of that Schrodinger equation, um, if, I, if I solve for the solutions and then I plot this wave function psi, you'll get things that I think most of you have seen before, right? So these are actually the solutions. There's more than one solution to this differential equation. It's actually a eigenvalue eigenfunction problem. Um, and if you plot all of the different psi that are solutions, you get things that look like this. And, and what these are, are the S and the P uh, and the D and the higher order um, orbitals of the hydrogen atom that you, that, that you have learned about in, in, in your chemistry classes here. And so for a single particle, like a hydrogen atom with one electron, we can solve this equation. But now think back to what I was saying before, like those steels or materials that have 16 different elements, right? And, uh, 16 different elements present. Uh, what ends up happening now is I don't have just one electron in the system. Uh, I end up with lots of different types of atoms with their nuclei, um, lots of different electrons associated with each atom. And that equation that looked a lot simpler on the previous page suddenly becomes a really complicated uh, partial differential equation. It's, it's a complicated enough that it's basically impossible to solve. This equation is exact the way that I've written it here. And if I could solve it for any system of particles, I would understand, I would be able to describe the properties of any collection of atoms uh, and, and tell you more or less whatever you want to know about that material. The problem is, is basically that we don't know how to solve this problem, uh, even today. Uh, the wave function itself suddenly is no longer a function of just one spatial dimension. It's not psi is a function of one electron, but it's a function of all these electrons. So actually, I mean, to be strictly correct, it's not even that we don't know mathematically or numerically how to solve this equation. The function that we're solving for is so big and high dimensional that we don't have computers that are capable of storing the solution, even if we uh, wanted to, even if we knew how to solve and, and obtain the solution itself directly. And so this to me is where computational modeling becomes really cool and really interesting. I have a complicated equation that I know is the answer. It's kind of like the, the law of the universe that governs the properties of materials, but I don't know how to solve it. And so what we do in computational material science is we try to take this equation and we try to find different ways of simplifying it into forms that we know how to solve. And that introduces the advantage that we now have simpler equations that we know how to solve, but it comes at the price of uh, the fact that I'm not solving the exact equation anymore. I'm solving an approximate equation. And, I, and you have to hope that the approximate equation that you're solving, the simplified version, you haven't simplified things too much. Otherwise, you might throw out the physics that you actually care about, and you may miss reality. Uh, and that's kind of like the, the real question in computational material science is, how can I make, how can I solve the equations that I need to solve? How can I make them solvable and simplified, but at the same time, make sure I'm still capturing the physics that I'm interested in? Uh, so how do we do, how, how do we solve those simplified equations? Um, a lot of the tools that, that we use in, in my research group 
uh, are high performance computing systems. And so we're really lucky here at Illinois. Um, we actually have access to uh, some of the world's greatest high performance computing resources here. Um, I'm showing here a picture of one of our computing systems that we have on campus. Uh, the name of the computing system is called Blue Waters. Uh, Blue Waters has, was built, I think, if I remember correctly, in the year 2013. Um, and uh, it's a, at, at some point in time, when it was initially built, it was actually the largest uh, supercomputer that was dedicated, in, in the world, that was dedicated to uh, doing non-classified research. And so um, it's what, what's called a petaflop computing facility. And so what petaflop means is that the supercomputer is actually capable of um, solving 13 quadrillion floating point operations or flops per second. Uh, Blue Waters has something like 25,000 compute nodes connected to each other in parallel to be able to, to, to dedicate to doing things like trying to solve the complicated quantum me mechanical equations that, that govern material properties. Uh, this computing system is actually, it's used by a lot of researchers on campus, not just by material scientists like me, but by um, uh, people studying cosmology and trying to simulate like the Big Bang. It's used by, uh, it, it's being used really extensively right now to try to understand and model virus spread, uh, since there's a lot of interest in that due to, due to the, the pandemic. Um, so it's used for a lot of different activities. Um, this is actually a really cool supercomputer. Um, when it was designed and built, uh, is actually a lot of the facilities around the supercomputer, the supercomputers themselves take a lot of power. Uh, a computer like this probably takes as much electricity as, as a small village of maybe 10,000 people or so. So it uses a lot of um, resources. When Blue Waters was designed, um, it's actually a LEED certified facility. Our, the mechanical engineering department here played a big role in trying to make the supercomputer as environmentally friendly as possible. And so uh, we designed like a, a water-based cooling system and on-site cooling towers that kind of take advantage of Illinois' cold winters. Uh, when this system was built, its estimated energy efficiency was about 85 to 90%. And that was really like kind of a, a, a really great example uh, compared to more typical efficiencies for supercomputing resources that we see around like 40% or so or something like that. Uh, so being here at Illinois, I'm kind of lucky because a lot of Illinois faculty like me have access to these computing resources that we can take advantage of in, in our research. Uh, not every supercomputer that we use um, in my group is, is a huge high performance supercomputer like, um, like Blue Waters. This is kind of a picture of my research group's own in-house uh, built computing cluster. So the name of this mini Mini parallel computer is Mirage. So I, I named it after my cat. Um, and this is my research group a couple of years ago. We went to, to visit the uh, computer facility here and you can kind of see we built Mirage ourselves. Uh, we connected all the nodes to each other. The yellow cables here are um, the InfiniBand cables that allow each node or each computer to talk to each other. Um, and so this computing resource is, you know, it's about in total, maybe 500 CPUs or processors, and we can run a lot of our quantum mechanical codes on those to try to solve some of those complicated quantum mechanical equations. Um, so what do we use that for? I'll, I'll give a couple of examples um, related to kind of like, now that, now that I've told you a little bit about the kinds of equations we're interested in and how we use computing resources to solve them, one of the things that I think is really great about computational research is um, we can apply it to a whole lot of different materials areas. Uh, so I work on um, electronic materials, photovoltaics, uh, shape memory alloys, thermoelectric materials. I work on, in the MERSEC, uh, two-dimensional materials and kind of the, the nanomechanical properties of 2D materials like graphene. Um, 
it's a, you know, as a numerical person, we can apply our methods and the governing equations to any material that you're actually interested in. And one of the really cool things I think about modeling and simulation is that um, we work together with experimentalists. And it could be the case that one of our experimental collaborators, for example, uh, they may do an experiment and they may get an interesting result. Uh, one of the really, but, but it's not always easy in an experiment, you, you can measure the result, but it's not always easy to understand exactly why you got the results you got or what's the physics underlying the, the results that you're observing. Um, and so I've always been kind of like the type of person who thinks why, why, why do things work the way they do? And I find computation and modeling and simulation is a really powerful tool to be able to understand that why question. You know, why did you measure the surprising behavior that you actually measured? And it's kind of neat to be able to simulate this on a computer because on a computer, I have the option of simulating um, the governing equations like the Schrodinger equation that I showed you. Um, I also have the option of um, trying to say to myself, ask myself questions like, okay, I don't know maybe what the governing equation is, but let me try making up a model and then running that model and seeing if it explains the experimental results. Uh, you can kind of like create your own little mini universes in some sense, and you can test and see whether what you get out of the the mini universe that you simulate on your computer has any resemblance to, to reality or not. Uh, and so it's kind of a neat way to, to try to understand the world. Um, I'll just give a, a couple of examples. Um, and, and some of them will relate to MERSEC work and, and, and some of them will. But one example of a type of material that we've been doing a lot of modeling on our shape memory alloys. Uh, so shape memory alloys are metals um, and they they're they're really cool metals it kind of they are what they sound like uh, they are metals that um, you can deform them a lot uh, you can you know pull them or or put them under uniaxial tension you can strain them up to 10 percent and then when you let them go they'll go back exactly to where they came from so they remember their starting shape and then even if you apply a really large mechanical load onto them, when you let it go, or when you heat the material back up, it'll go back to where it came from. Uh, so that's a shape memory material. And so if you think really about like what underlies that or, or, or how does it work? So this is kind of like the shape memory effect. Let's imagine um, that I start with a shape memory material and it looks like this one here. Uh, this is the, the lattice, and it kind of has this uh, uh, skew rhomb rhombohedral crystal structure to it. A shape memory material is a, a material that um, when you raise the temperature, it undergoes a phase transformation. And so you would go from this low temperature, low symmetry crystal structure to a high temperature, high symmetry crystal structure. So if I take this material here, let's say at room temperature, and I heat it up, it'll transform into a different crystal structure. And as a result of that phase transformation, it changes its shape. Uh, it, and it changes its shape pretty dramatically. Uh, now, if I take that and I cool it back down again, it'll phase transform. And when it phase transforms back, you might go, you, you might go from, you'll go from the high temperature phase to the low, low temperature phase. Uh, but that low temperature phase can have these rhombohedral configurations, you know, both the ones that point to the left and to the right. And you'll end up with something that kind of looks like this. Um, and if I take that, so, so going from here to here, you more or less maintain the same shape. But if I deform it or pull it, these green pointing to the left uh, uh, rhomb rhombi will turn all into the red ones pointing to the right and the material will undergo a really large uh, physical shape change associated with it. Uh, so one of the really cool applications of these 
shape memory alloys is something called uh, the elastocaloric effect. And so this is also another word that sounds complicated, but it really means what it sounds like. It's a material that when I stretch it, right, elastic, um, the other word is calorie. It's a material that when I stretch it, it changes the material's temperature. So an elastocaloric material is a material that when you, um, when, when you load it mechanically, you stretch it or you pull it, the material's temperature changes quite a bit. Uh, and the reason the temperature changes is because of this phase transformation. So if I pull this material and the phase transformation takes place, there's, all, there's a latent heat associated with that phase transformation uh, and that causes the temperature of the material to change. And so here's some work from some of our experimental collaborators just sort of illustrating the elastocaloric effect in one shape memory alloy. So again, this is a, a, a metal. This is in this case, nickel iron gallium. Um, and so in this experiment, they're pooling on the sample. This is the sample here. They're pooling and pooling. The color is the temperature, so it's hot. They're gonna let go really fast. And you can see when they let go, the temperature drops and it drops by about 10 degrees Celsius. So this is the kind of thing if you're holding it, you could feel the temperature drop with your hands. Um, and so this is a really, really, uh, it's like a neat phenomenon. It's a emerging approach to, I mean, I think if you have a refrigerator in your kitchen, you're used to hearing the compressor run. Uh, this is kind of a, like an alternative or an emerging solid state approach to heating and refrigeration would be to use a material like this to drive a heat engine, uh, to being able to do that. And the reason we don't do it yet though, is because, so this material, nickel iron gallium, which is an elastocaloric material, is, um, it's actually pretty good, right? So, so I'll play this video again, oops. Mm -mm. Uh, it's pretty good, so we're straining it in stress and strain. Here you can see the linear elastic response here. Pooling, pooling, pooling. Uh, stress strain curve is linear. And then here, when the stress strain curve turns flat, the phase transformation is taking place. So it's the material is transforming to the high temperature phase. And then in the experiment, we let go of that we release the load right away, and then the whole material suddenly phase transforms back. You go back exactly to where you started, and the temperature in the material has dropped by more than 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, so the materials science question here then is, um, this shape memory alloy, nickel iron gallium, is pretty good, right? I can get a 12 degree Celsius temperature drop by doing this experiment. Um, but it's not quite enough, not yet. Uh, not, a net, not, not a large enough temperature drop to like really run a thermodynamic you know, heat engine or cycle based on it. And so the kinds of things that I can do with a computer is I can say, all right, this is a good example of a material, but can I find other alloys or other compositions for this shape memory alloy that will give me an even larger temperature drop? Uh, which is basically saying, can I find a shape memory alloy so that when that phase transformation takes place, the latent heat of the phase transformation is even larger. And so that's something we, we can simulate on a computer and it's faster and easier to do it on a computer uh, than it is to try to build lots of different, um, try to like grow lots of different crystals and measure their properties. Uh, Kind of another example of a shape memory material is a magnetocaloric material. Uh, and this is a similar type of thing. Um, a magnetocaloric shape memory alloy is a material that uh, is one where now when you apply a magnetic field to the material, you get a change in temperature. Um, and the effect is I mean, kind of gallium, similar. Is an alloy capability? Uh, let me turn this volume down. Stretch. So you can just, yeah, there we go. So 
This is an example of a magnetocaloric material. So this is nickel manganese gallium. And you can see it's kind of the, the actual size of this metal here is probably kind of like the size of my thumb. Um, and all that they're doing is turning a magnetic field on and off. And as they actuate that magnetic field, you can see the, the shape of the sample changing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so this is something that you could use um, also in order to, uh, for example, use a magnetic field to create uh, an actuator or, or, or a, a mechanical system that, that pumps or, or do other things like that. And so um, these magnetic shape memory alloys allow you to do this, but again, um, they're, they, they, they work pretty well, but they're not under wide scale commercial usage yet. And that's because typically they require two large magnetic fields to be able to get that large scale transformation inside of the materials. And so the kinds of things that we can do with our computers is say, I can, I can go back and say, all right, well, nickel manganese gallium is pretty good, but what if I replaced the gallium with indium and I tried nickel manganese indium instead? Uh, could, could indium work just as well? And so this is just an example of um, experiments on the left and then our simulations on the right. Uh, what you want to look at, oops. What you want to try to look at here is there we go. Okay. The green line on the left, um, and then compare it to the blue line on the right. The green is the experimental measurement of the magnetization. Um, and then the blue on the right is our modeling and simulation. And you can see that the trends are really similar. Uh, my student, Brian, uh, spent a lot of time trying to develop a simplified model that can reproduce the experimental result for this known shape memory alloy. It's a model that combines quantum mechanical modeling uh, together with statistical mechanics or Monte Carlo sampling to be able to describe how the magnetization inside the material varies with the temperature. Um, and so I'll try to kind of like explain what you're seeing here. If I can find my arrow. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at this green line um, here, so the, the phase transformation in this material from the low temperature to the high temperature phase occurs around here, uh, around 200 Kelvin or so. And this is kind of an interesting material because it's a material where the low temperature phase is non-magnetic and the high temperature phase is magnetic. And so that's why at low temperature, the magnetization is zero. And then you can see that as you get close to the transformation temperature, the, magnet, the, the magnetization within the material increases. There's this little jump here, uh, which is there for complicated reasons that I'm not gonna go into right now. Um, but then the magnetization when you're in the high temperature phase is non-zero. And then here it suddenly drops to zero again because you hit the Curie temperature of the high temperature phase. Uh, and so being able to predict this curve tells us a lot about the operating temperature range that we could use this material um, in a magnetic cycle. And so what we have to do if we want to model and simulate this is, you know, we, we always kind of use this two-step procedure in modeling and simulation. Um, the first thing is we have to make sure that our model is good. Uh, and we do that by comparing it to experiment. Uh, and so we, we, can, we can take these experimental results. And then in this case, the model here is, like I said, it's a combination of quantum mechanical simulations and statistical Monte Carlo simulations. We can kind of play with that model until it matches the experimental results. Um, that is, you're halfway there at that point, but you're not done. It's very, well, I won't say very easy, but it's, um, it's always possible to come up with a model that describes known results. The next big step, or, or really the harder thing then, 
is to see if you can take that model that you know describes answers you know, but then you can, but see if it also predicts new things that you don't know. This is kind of like the difference between a descriptive model and a predictive model. Uh, a descriptive model is one that you, you use to describe things you already know, but then you, and, and it's good to have, it's important to have a descriptive model, but then you also need to go and test that model on things it doesn't, uh, on things that you, you, you haven't tried or fitted it to before. Um, and showing that a model is predictive, once you predict a couple things that, that with your model, maybe that, that were unknown before, then you really start to have confidence that, oh, maybe this model that I've come up with like actually has some bearing in reality or, or actually has some grounding. And once you have that model that works, then Brian, my student who's worked on this, can take that model and he can try applying it to different material compositions and, trying, and, and try to search for kind of like the optimal magnetic shape memory alloy. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about our work on thermoelectric materials as well, but I, I, I don't want to like rush myself through too many things. Um, so let me just kind of go on to the last example that I, that I wanted to give. Um, and this is kind of related to using uh, modeling and data analytics methods to try to control or get a bit better handle on manufacturing processes. And so those of you who are um, working in IRG2 in the MERSEC uh, have probably been working quite a bit on uh, the two-dimensional material graphene, right? So graphene is this two-dimensional sheet of sp2 bonded carbon atoms, uh, looks like this, that makes this nice honeycomb lattice. Uh, some of the desirable properties of graphene are that it's very high strength material, very electrically conductive, uh, very flexible, um, and it has some really kind of cool, unique, or exotic physics properties associated with it also, like, like superconductivity. Uh, lots of potential applications. Um, you can use it as a transparent conducting material. I mean, if you've ever stopped and thought about it, most of our conductors are not transparent. Uh, it's really a special set of properties that allows a material to be both transparent and conducting at the same time. Uh, you can use it as a sensor. You can use it in, in flexible electronics as well. Um, for as long as graphene has been around, it's really kind of interesting that we're still working on figuring out how to really commercialize devices made out of graphene. Uh, it's a big step to go from like taking a material that works in a research lab to being able to scalably produce and manufacture that material inside of a, a uh, in, in a commercial application or, or in an industrial setting. Uh, we really, you know, step one is to kind of get a handle on the physics and the material science, but then step two is to be able to figure out how to take that material um, and produce it at, at scale uh, in large volume in, in an inexpensive way. Uh, so one of the things that, that we've been working on kind of related to this problem is how can we synthesize how can we synthesize graphene in a way that is scalable and inexpensive and gives you good results all the time uh, graphene is typically you know there's two common ways to make it one is the scotch tape method exfoliation um, and that's how you really get the high quality material uh, the second way that it's made is a method called cvd or chemical vapor deposition synthesis. And so this is a process where um, you introduce carbon containing gases into a chamber uh, with a metal catalyst or substrate. And all those carbon containing gases, uh, you heat them up to a high temperature, they interact and react with each other inside that chamber. And they kind of form, uh, if you if the properties are if the, the furnace temperature and chamber settings and process parameters are exactly right, um, you end up with this really nice, high quality crystalline sample of graphene. And for this to be able to be used commercially, 
uh, the area of graphene that you produce has to be really large. Its quality has to be really good. So you should really have this nice honeycomb lattice without a lot of defects or, or um, uh, you know, grain boundaries or, or bond rotations or things like that in there. Um, and you want to be able to get that good result every single time. Uh, the problem is that the synthesis process itself is really complex. Um, it's something that if a new research group wanted to try to grow graphene using chemical vapor deposition and they started today, it would probably take them about six months to fine tune and get a precise recipe that works for them. Uh, lots of effort and, and, and lots of, of, of time gets spent on trying to get a high quality recipe uh, using this CBD synthesis process. And so um, one of the things that we've been working on is trying to uh, build these kind of like tools to be able to model the synthesis process um, and allow experimentalists who grow graphene to be able to kind of like accelerate their knowledge around the growth process itself. This is just an example of like the wide variety of shapes that you can get if you vary those process parameters just a little bit. Now you can go from, this is, this would be considered a really good result, a nice big single domain hexagon, high crystalline quality. Uh, and then you can see that in some cases, the growth recipe that was used barely made any graphene, if at all. Um, in some cases you got graphene, but rather than one single nucleus that grows into a nice big hexagon, maybe you got lots of uh, high density of nuclei that grow into smaller and smaller patches instead. Um, so some of the tools that we have built, so we don't just like run a lot of computational code, but we develop a lot of our own code to try to help um, experimentalists better understand this process. And so what I wanted to, to show you was um, an example of some of the software that we've built that allows an experimentalist who has grown a graphene sample um, and taken an SEM image of that graphene sample. So here's what that, S here's what that SEM image looks like. Um, it'll allow them to to rapidly and in an, in an automated way determine how much graphene they got when they did their growth experiment and whether they got good, nice, regular hexagons, if there's one big hexagon or lots of small hexagons, how aligned they are with each other. Uh, and so we um, have developed a lot of simulation tools that use machine learning or artificial intelligence. It's basically an image processing route where the computer will look at a picture um, of grown graphene. And just by analyzing that picture and looking for regions of different contrast, uh, like brighter regions or darker regions, the computer will try to determine where's there, where is graphene and, and where there's not graphene. Uh, and so it's kind of like a way for experimentalists if you try you know, 200 growth recipes um, and you have 200 SEM images, it allows them to rapidly analyze what they got and how good each recipe was. And it'll kind of, the idea is to accelerate their ability to be able to improve um, their growth procedure. And so these were some tools that, that we developed. Um, they use machine learning or artificial intelligence. And, and really what that means is that um, we have to take a lot of, we have to go to our experimental colleagues and ask them to provide us their pictures that they have of graphene. Uh, and then we have to um, train a computer, show a computer model, show an image processing routine, all these images, and, and actually tell the computer, this is graphene, this is not graphene, this is graphene, this is not graphene. And the more you train the computer, the better it gets at it. Uh, so, at some point, the computer has developed a good enough internal model that you'll give it a completely new picture and it should be able to tell you with reasonable accuracy um, where you have graphene and where you don't have graphene. So I haven't gone into a lot of details on like what machine learning methods we used in here, um, but I wanted to, 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 to show you kind of like one of the neat things we've been able to do with that um, 
with that image processing capability that we developed for a material science application um, and have since uh, with my awesome REU students this summer, we took that same image processing capability um, and we're applying it now to being able to uh, analyze pictures of people from publicly available images and detect whether people are wearing face masks or not. So it's kind of a neat example of two things that sound very different, right? Graphene synthesis and face mask wearing habits of people in the public. Uh, but both of them are problems that involve the use of image processing and, and the use of artificial intelligence to, to being able to use that image processing. And so, um, uh, so, so Hugh and Jeffrey um, spent some time this summer starting to get familiar with the SEM image processing tool. And then they've been implementing a similar tool that now rather than looking at SEM pictures of people wearing um, uh, of graphene, they're, they're using artificial intelligence to analyze pictures of people and determine whether people are wearing face masks or not. Uh, and, and so it's really a very similar approach. Uh, the idea here is that um, we train neural networks to be able to do two things. The first thing is to take a picture that you give it and then determine where the humans are in that picture. And, and so humans can be detected. You, you look for two eyes and a nose and a mouth. There's certain common patterns or features that are always there when there's a human present. And so you first train the neural network to be able to determine when a human is present in a picture. Um, and then, you, then the second thing you have to do once it's found the people in the images is you train the neural network to answer the question of, is there a mask or is there not a mask on this person? It's a lot like, is there graphene or is there not graphene in this, uh, in this background picture? From the perspective of image processing, it's a really similar problem. Uh, and so uh, the REU students that I've been working with have been creating a graphical Jupyter interface to, the, to this open source code um, that's available uh, by PyImage Search. And they're actually publishing this code. So they'll be publishing this software on, on NanoHub. Um, and you can kind of see here that the neural network um, that they've been able to train here is one that uh, you have to, like as I mentioned before, the same as we did with graphene, you have to, while you're training the computer, provide lots of examples of pictures of people with masks and without masks. Uh, when you train the computer model, you have to tell it the answer and have it learn. Try to develop a mathematical model to be able to analyze an image and say face mask, no face mask, face mask, or no face mask. And that's the training phase here. And then at the end, test it on a new or unknown data set. And this kind of goes back to that idea that I, that I mentioned several times. Uh, you develop a model and, and you test it on things you know and see if you get the right answer. And when you establish the confidence that you're getting the right answer on things you know, now you test it on something new or, or different. And, 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 and if you've done a good job, uh, maybe, <clears throat> maybe everything works and, and you're done. Uh, really more often than not, you have to go back and tweak the model because maybe you didn't get something right. But that iterative cycle kind of goes back and forth. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you end up with a model that is, that is capable of making good predictions uh, for, for uh, a, a relevant application. 